from Melbourne, Australia, and I want to say I've got a fantastic guest. She's worldwide. Australia's loved her. The world's loved her. Everybody loves <laughs> Melanie. How are you today, Melanie? Hi. Melanie, I want to say Australia's always loved you and still loves you, right? And you give this warmth to the world, right? Your career is like this thing that shines around the world every day through your songs, and I mean that sincerely. And I want to ask you something. Have you heard of a song in 1970 called Melanie Makes Me Smile? The first line goes, my Melanie makes me smile. Have you heard of it? No. Okay. This song is dedicated to you. I've always associated this song with you right from 1970. Wow. Right? And it was a big hit for the strangers in Australia. And it was a big hit for Tony Burrows out of a group called Edison Lighthouse. And I'm going to play you a bit of the song now. Funny that nobody ever told me this. I'm here to tell you things that no one knows, right? That's what I do. I just want to say you bring such a warmth and love to the world. Your songs are unbelievable. Now, I need to ask you, have the Beatles played a big part in your career influencing you? And if so, what are your favourite Beatles songs and what is it about them that moves you? Wow. I wasn't a Beatles fan until... Later, um, like I wasn't one of the screaming girls in the in the crowd, but um, you know that was just my way. I was kind of if the world was going that way, I was going that way, <laughs> and um, so I, I I didn't really tune into the Beatles till um, they started soul searching. I guess um, my first uh, favorite. A Beatles song was, um, what was it? Uh, the the wall, the one, yeah. The what should you know? You can catch his disease. Come together. Yeah, come together. Right come together. Now. All for me. 
bam, bam. I thought that was so cool. What I loved about it, I loved their spirit of play. You know, they had such this, just whatever they thought of, they did. And I, I just, I, that's what I loved about them. And it made me know that, that's that was good that's I was coming from that place because but the difference is they were guys and could much more get away with being silly than a girl is as soon as a girl does something like I got a brand new pair of roller skates you know it's it's all over you discounted as you know just a cute listening or something but um yeah men can get away with silly a lot more like Randy Newman and um, short people. Like if I had done short people, they probably never would have played my record ever again. <laughs> Brand New Key is a quirky song. It's not really a quirky song. It's a tom It's a song of the times. And even here in Australia, we had the mixtures and they did a song called Push Bike Song. These are songs you haven't heard, but it's in a similar style to your song, all right? So what uh -huh. I'm trying to say is you can appreciate that an artist does what they want to do and then the acceptance is, what is the acceptance? Are you doing the songs for the people or are you doing the songs for yourself? Are you doing it to please yourself? Are you trying to please them? But I can tell you, every single song that you wrote and recorded is a signature song just for you. And Lay <laughs> Down is one of the greatest protest songs that ever was. It's like this song that's so unique and so strong. It's such a strong song. It's got the biggest message. And that Lay Down, I can tell you, is one of the greatest protest songs ever written and performed oh. by yourself. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I mean, it, it was an emotional, creative expression right from the get-go. I, I thought of that anthemic part, you know, the lay down chorus as I was leaving Woodstock and um, I hadn't written the song yet. So it's kind of amusing when people say, I heard you do candles in the rain at Woodstock. <laughs> said, no, you didn't, because <laughs> I, I hadn't written it yet. But I got the inspiration from that night when I happened to be the person that was on the stage when the candle lighting started to take place. And that was, it's significant, you know, because it, it just was a symbol, you know, that that I had this incredible flow of humanity coming toward me. And I, I, I really got something from the people that I can never repay. You know, I really can never repay except through the music. And that's what I did. I had that song and we, we went to the studio and at first the Edwin Hawkins singers um, they said they couldn't do it because it wasn't religious enough. You know, it didn't have God, Jesus, nothing. So um, I said, yeah, but, you know, it, it is really spiritual. But I was shy and I wasn't pushing it. But my husband, Peter Shakarik, he was not shy. And he, he went to them and he, he convinced me that Edwin Hawkins himself said, yes, we'll do it. But in actual fact, that isn't the case. I went to a gymnasium where they were rehearsing, thinking that I was going to be rehearsing with them. And they didn't have any idea that this was happening. And here I am. I open the door, the back door of the gymnasium. I go in and they're, they look like they're in the middle of a song and they stop and it looked like, who's she? You know, what's this? And I have a guitar. I look at my husband next to me. He was my producer, manager, everything. And um, he, he said, yeah, it's OK. It's OK. And he runs ahead and talks to Edwin Hawkins. And they're gesturing. And my husband is waving his arms. And Edwin Hawkins is shaking his head. And, um, and Peter signals me. I guess he thinks this is the moment. 
he needs the fire. And so he signals me and I have no choice. I go down where they're rehearsing with the piano and I start singing Lay Down. And by the second chorus, the whole group started singing with me. And we, that was it. That was the rest is history. I went into the studio with them. We recorded one take. That's pretty wild. That's pretty right? good. <laughs> with a group of 46 voices, one take. And um, Freddie Kutera was the engineer. And it was electric magic. Absolutely nothing like this ever happened in the studio again, or before or after with me. And um, the conga player from uh, Santana was the, the, the drummer, and it was Edwin Hawkins and me on a guitar. I, I played three chords, you know. I mean, it was incredible. But it, again, you know, the human spirit has something that is that people try to explain it in words, but this was one of those absolutely electric moments. And it went on for eight minutes. Now, Melanie, I want to ask you what it was like in Woodstock, because you got to understand, I, I'm honest with you, in 1969, there's Jimi Hendrix, there's Jefferson Airplane, right? Which I love that, so that song, Somebody to Love, right? I love that song. Right? Did yeah. you meet most of those people? What? Who was the in crowd that you met when you were there? You know, I wish I could have been more of a person who hung out, but I was really shy. Okay. And when I got to the field, they um, there was like I guess an upper echelon tent, and then maybe the folkies were in these little tents. I was right across from Tim Harden who had written If I Was a Carpenter. And um, he wrote some beautiful songs. But uh, every, I mean, everybody was scared. And uh, the upper echelon tent had amenities, you know, like Joan Baez, who was my, I mean, she was my idol. You know, I, I just loved Joan Baez. So I wanted to be Joan Baez. And I didn't make it. <laughs> no. Her voice, I was, my voice was way grotty, you know, is scratchy and much more deep. And it, I was an alto, you know, a true alto. Your voice is totally unique. Make no mistake, <laughs> yeah. it's signature. Uh, started a trend and girls sounding like that. <laughs> no, I kind of regret it in a way because it's a bit much, you know, because. I just, that's the way I sounded. I didn't go out to try to sound like that. You know, when somebody goes out to try to sound like that, it's like, <laughs> you know? but um, anyway, yeah, I was um, there that all those people were there, but I never got to see them. I saw Jimi Hendrix later on his, at, on his way back, uh, to, back from the Isle of Wight. We were on a, a plane together and um it was it was that time of them and us, you know, that was very strangely they were pitting, you know, them against the kid groups, you know, people. And uh, it was so crazy. You know, now that I look back, I see how the media can do that. You know, it's so easy for them to manipulate huge groups of people to think that we're different when we're really all the same. What was it like when you're on the stage and you see this mass of people? I mean, if that's not the scariest thing out, that it would was, be like an unbelievable terrible. experience. You know, I, I can't believe I did it. You know, I think if somebody said do that now, I don't know if I would. <laughs> I have too much sense. You know? I didn't have any sense at all. In fact, I, I was supposed to be, um, I, I kept, they kept calling me. You're on next. You're on next. Because I was an easy, you plug me in and I'm done, you know. But I didn't have all kinds of instruments to test or anything. So all throughout the day, I got there in the morning. Um, Richie Havens was performing. Um, when I got to my little tent, I, I, I looked, I mean, I was, I was alone. I was all by myself. 
I didn't have a, a roadie. I didn't have a group. I didn't have anything. And I, I was thinking, how am I going to get out of here? <laughs> I really have to get out of here. Again, I didn't get to meet any of the superstars. I, I was not a veteran performer. I mean, I had done a few things. I, the, you know, it was called the bitter end and in the village. And I had done uh, one show at town hall and uh, I had one song, one song that an underground DJ was playing called beautiful people. And that was the only thing, maybe, maybe one or 2% of that entire audience ever heard that song, you know, cause it was still, underground it would became what they call a turntable hit i don't know if you had that expression but it was um, a dj would get a hold of a record and start playing it and people loved it but the record companies didn't believe in it so they didn't actually have the products out for people to buy so it was a hit it was being played everywhere but um nobody could own it Everything you do, he may be sitting 
right next to you. He may be a beautiful people too. And if you take care of him, well, maybe he'll take care of you. Cause all of the beautiful people do. And I'm a beautiful people too. What other pop groups did you like of the 60s? Like I love loving loving spoonful. I'm just saying, who do you who did you admire in the 60s? The groups, the birds, who did you really like? Yeah, you know, it's funny because at that one point I was just a touring musician with all those people, you know, and um I, I didn't get a chance to really uh take apart. Or, or really get to examine or listen to many of the my peers, you know. Uh, again, I, I loved, later on, I liked Joan Armitrading. You know, Joan Armitrading's music, she, she had some really great songs. Um, but my musical tastes are all over the place, you know, different jazz people and, uh, again, Nina Simone. But pop, pop groups, I was... Um, I was a little, I, I didn't like anything that felt put together, you know, the, so that that kind of uh, put me out of uh, listening carefully to what, because a lot of times behind the, um, the glitz and glamour, there's a lot of good stuff that you can miss if you're, if you're a snob. <laughs> you know? I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be a snob, but I guess because I had a, I, I was so afraid that I would lose myself, you know, because it's so easy. Uh, you want you want people to like you, you know. You don't want to lose your platform. You don't want to lose the people who are following you. So it's it's so tempting to do things that you think others will like. Look at what they done to my song. Look at what they done to my song. It was the only thing that I could do half right, and it's turning out all wrong. Ma. Look at what they done to my song. Ah, oh, look at. What they done to my brain oh. Look what they done to my brain Well, they picked it like a chicken bone And I think I'm half insane oh. Look what they done to my song I wish that I could find a good book to live in. I wish I could find a good book. Well, if I could find a real good book, I'd never have to come out and look at what they done to my song. Ils ont changé ma chanson. Ma. Ils ont changé ma chanson. C'est les seules choses que je peux faire et ce n'est pas bon. Ma. Ils ont changé ma chanson. But maybe. It'll all be all right, Ma. Maybe it'll all be okay. Well, if the people are buying tears, I'll be rich someday, Ma. Look what they've done to my song. Look at what they done to my song, Ma. Look what they done to my song, Ma. You know that they tied it up in a plastic bag and turned it upside down, oh, Ma. Ma, look at what they done to my song. Da -da. 
What appeals to me is I saw the Jack Douglas show, the Johnny Carson show, whatever show. I've seen all those shows. What really stands out is, right, I'm being honest, here you are, a beautiful woman on the TV, performing faultless. And that's the image that went out there. And, I mean, when you look back, how great is that? I know. I can't believe it was me. <laughs> you know, really, I, I look and I think, I don't know if I could do that. You know, I, I don't think I, I don't even know where that kind of, I just felt like this was, I had an angel or something, you know, sort of guiding me. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but it, it always felt like there was this sort of protective force around me. I, and I totally get it. And and I and I just sort of knew that there were I, I couldn't I I had to be true, you know, and and um, you know, some people might laugh at that, but um I felt I had to be true to myself. I had a, opportunities to become more well known over the years, uh, but it would involve selling my soul to the devil. I saw that French interview where they're talking to you in French and you're talking back. And you got to understand, the image is beautiful on the screen. It's like you're, you're worldwide, whether you're in Europe or you're in France or you're in America or you're in the UK, no matter where you are, your identity and your personality, and at that particular time period, you're top of the mountain because you're just like, without even trying to be the product, you are the product. You look the part. You play the part and you're so unique. That's what makes you so universal. Oh, well, thank you. I really need that right now. <laughs> thank you. I love your background. I love your um, background. The colors and everything are so pretty. Since the um, whole lockdown and everything uh, gave us a chance to think and reflect and uh, I wrote a lot of songs, a lot of songs, and um, we're going to be putting them out. I do have a download. I'm an independent artist. Who would have thought, you know? Um, and I have uh, music that's downloadable on Bandcamp. I did um, a live. I did. We were doing online shows because we didn't know what else to do. I mean, right before the lockdown, I went and did, uh, was it Port Ferry? festival i had done a tour of the netherlands and i was supposed to be going to uh seattle which was here it was like ground zero for the whole beginning of the lockdown and i was determined to keep going and keep going but at one point it was nothing and so we we did online shows and i kept writing and my son is um a musical director producer a virtuoso guitar player. He's amazing. And if you do get a chance to catch our online show, if I can't get down to Australia soon, it's a long trip. Oh, well, in the beginning, I, I think I traveled there half a dozen times easy. Um, e even with my children, I had babies and you know, equipment and, <laughs> and um, bands and no bands. And uh, I ended up once in Australia doing a tour. Um, my band decided uh, they didn't want to be in the music business anymore. And they decided that on my tour you know? <laughs> and they left, they had gotten paid and they left town. And I'm, I had a whole rest of the tour to do. I finished the tour with them. Um, a didgeridoo player and we and we did this magical concert in darwin it was absolutely astounding and and the the vibe was incredible the didgeridoo is really soulful it's got some deep deep frequencies you know and i i'm a believer in the power of frequency 
you know, so um, yeah, we're, we perform in um, a, a 432, which is a different, it's not 440 anyway. I won't go into that too much, but um, you know, it's, uh, it's powerful stuff, frequencies. So we're, I mean, I'm, I'm just in it, you know, I'm going to be singing and playing and writing till the very end. So here I am, like it or not, you know, yeah, I don't worry about anything. I just, I just keep doing it, you know, and I make, um, the, the songs keep coming and I keep writing. It's one of those things that age doesn't have anything to do with. Exactly. Yes, your, your vocal cords change and, you know, some people um, might think, oh, she sounds different. Yeah, I'm supposed to. <laughs> That's what happens. You get different. Um, it's like that old Velveteen Rabbit thing, you know, <laughs> I'm the old Velveteen Rabbit. So um, anyway, if you uh, want to hear the stuff I'm doing, I'll, I'll send you a download and everything. Of the songs that you've written, the hits, Melanie, can you tell me your top three hits, the ones that you love, that you recorded and wrote? Well, as far as an album, I think the um, the Stone Ground Words album was the one that I felt, you know, that was, and Gather Me. I mean, I have songs on Gather Me that, that included Brand New Key, but I was very careful on the, B side, we used to have an A side and a B side. The, on the B side, I put Some Say, which is a lot more of an introspective kind of a song. And I, it was important to me that people understood that I wasn't like a one dimensional person, that there were, there were, you know, moods. And you could, you know, if you, in fact, mostly I was in a much moodier place musically than, um, happy go lucky place and you know but it's just um i think stone ground words is one of the ones in gather me um and then more recently uh the songs that i'm recording now i mean i guess because it's it's what you just did you know so you get really excited about what you're doing um which is uh, just keeps me going, you know. That's amazing. This new stuff that you got coming out, just keep churning it out for the world. I toured Melbourne. I did. Um, I did that beautiful wooden, uh, that theater in Melbourne, that beautiful wooden one. What is that called? That uh, it's a big uh, theater, and it's all wood inside. It's magnificent. It it's very modern, but um, oh yeah, that could be the. Uh... That could be the one near the gallery there. They've got a big uh, art gallery. And next to that is they've got an exhibition building there. It's like a, a very special place. It's like a concert hall. Yeah. I think you did yeah. that. Yeah. Anyway, I did that. I it, it was a sold out tour. So it went really good. So I should be able to come back. <laughs> no, you can come back anytime you want. Do you remember the year that was? Um, was it? 2015 or something like that. Melanie, thank you so much for being on the show. And as I said, the only thing we can say is your music lives on forever. Your performances on video live on forever. And thank you so much for being on the Plastic EP show. Woo! Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me. Ooh. Mm -hmm.